Hello and welcome to my Biochemistry of Cancer video and in this video I'll be discussing the 10 hallmarks of cancer which was recently published in the Hanahan and Weinberg paper 2011 The Hallmarks of Cancer, The Next Generation So the learning objectives are to be able to list the 10 hallmarks of cancer and to give examples where possible how tumour cells utilise these hallmarks to ensure their growth and survival Ok so this is the picture taken from their paper So if we go from in a clockwise fashion the 10 hallmarks of cancer are evading growth suppressors Avoiding immune destruction, enabling replicative immortality, tumour promoting inflammation, activating invasion and metastasis, inducing angiogenesis, genome instability and mutation, resisting cell death, deregulating cellular energetics, and sustaining proliferative signalling. So these are the 10 hallmarks of cancer. If we go outside to this side, these are the different methods that Hanahan and Weinberg discussed of how we can prevent these hallmarks from actually taking action. Whereas rather, I'm going to be discussing more of the biochemistry behind each of these specific hallmarks. Okay, so the first hallmark is evading growth suppressors. And the role of growth suppressors is to negatively regulate proliferation, so to prevent cellular growth and division. The tumor suppressor genes involve P53 or T53, retinoblastoma 1, and transforming growth factor beta. However, in tumor cells, these are inactivated, so these have no control in suppressing growth. So P53 arrests cells in the gene naught phase of mitosis until DNA is checked for errors or repair any damage which could have been as a result of oxidative stress or UV rays from sun for example. Retinoblastoma 1 blocks cells between the G1 and the S phase by regulating the function of cyclin and cyclin dependent kinase complexes which I will discuss in a future picture. And then transforming growth factor beta stops cells at the G1 phase However, this is an example of a cancer cell which has mutated the proteins along the signal cascade, which therefore prevent the action of transforming growth factor beta. So as a result of the deregulation in these growth suppressors, tumor cells are then able to grow and divide indefinitely and just keep continuously grow without being suppressed. Okay, so this is a diagram which demonstrates how P53 controls growth. So when DNA is damaged, or a cell in general is damaged, which can be as a result, as I mentioned, of oxidative stress, hypoxia, which is low oxygen levels, or telomere erosion, which I'll be discussing later, P53 is then activated. This can then go on to either regulate P53 target genes, which can then control metabolic homeostasis, antioxidant defense, DNA repair, or growth arrest. Or it can then associate with protein-protein interactions, which can then induce apoptosis. So depending on the degree of stress that the cell is under depends on which mechanism P53 acts upon. So for example, if a cell is mildly damaged as a result of a single UV ray, P53 can then go on to activate DNA repair mechanisms. However, if the DNA is completely destroyed, say for example by gamma radiation from radiation sources, the cell can then undergo apoptosis to make sure the cell does not go on to form a tumour mass. Okay, so this diagram shows how retinoblastoma 1 controls cell growth. However, I'm not going to go into details about this due to time constraints, but there's plenty of research articles available which will give a very good overview of this. Similarly, for transforming growth factor beta, I'm not going to go into details about it, but there are plenty of articles available. Okay, so the second hallmark is avoiding immune destruction. So the majority of small tumours are actually destroyed by the innate immune system. So even before the tumour cell has an opportunity to grow and divide, our innate immune system is able to destroy it before it even becomes a problem. However, like everything in biology, nothing's perfect. Occasionally, a small tumour can slip by the immune system. Once it becomes a large solid tumour, it's actually then able to avoid detection, so therefore it's able to evade destruction. This is noticed in that there is a greater instance in cancers in immunocompromised or immunosuppressed individuals. So those who have infected with HIV, can then lead on to tumor virus infections such as herpes virus or Epstein-Barr virus or hepatitis virus. Please note, HIV is not a tumor virus, okay? It does not directly cause cancer. All it does is immunocompromise or immunosuppress the individual. Okay, so this knowledge of how the immune system can prevent cancer was found out using an experiment with mice. So imagine we've got an immunodeficient mouse right here and it's got cancer. If we transplant this tumour into an immunocompetent host, we can see that the tumour is destroyed. Alternatively, if we have an immunocompetent host, we transplant the tumour into an immunodeficient mouse, we can see that the tumour still is able to develop. 
However, if we have the immunocompetent host transplant the tumour into another immunocompetent host, so even though this is still being recognised as a foreign body, it's still not able to be destroyed. So we can see that the immune system does have some role or influence in how our cancer can progress. Okay, so the third hallmark is enabling replicative immortality. So at the end of our chromosomes, we have excess DNA called telomeres. So as we see from this diagram here, here in the light blue, we have our normal chromosome, and in the pink, we have telomeres. So as a cell divides, the telomeres are gradually eroded away to the point where the telomeres are then at the point of the chromosomes. So in a normal case, when the telomeres are this close to the chromosome, the cell will enter senescence, so it's no longer able to grow or divide. However, tumor cells have an enzyme called telomerase, which can then add telomeres onto the end of the chromosomes. So in a normal cell, we have the telomeres eroding to the point of the chromosome. If they erode any further, the cell will then undergo apoptosis. However, a tumor cell can then continuously add on these telomeres, so the cell can just literally just replicate over and over again. So the cell can now divide indefinitely without entering senescence. Okay, so the fourth form of cancer is tumor-promoting inflammation. So chronic inflammation as a result of an autoimmune disease, chronic bacterial, viral, or parasitic infections, or toxicity to substances can cause normal cells to develop proneoplastic mutations and resistance to apoptosis. And that's taken by Schachter and Weizmann, 2002. So COX-2, or cyclooxygenase 2, generates prostaglandin E2, or PGE2, which is a well-known inflammatory mediator. And from what we know, COX-2 is highly overexpressed in many tumour cells. So the tumour itself is generating inflammatory responses. So inflammation can also recruit leukocytes such as neutrophils and macrophages to the tumour microenvironment. Macrophages then release cytokines and growth factors which aid in nourishing the tumour. Okay, so this picture is taken from Howard Tal 2012. So over here, imagine we've got a tumour mass and some monocytes have begun an immune response against it. They can release cytokines and interleukins which can then cause the recruitment of other monocytes and immune cells towards the tumour mass. This is what we have here. So here you can see the tumour cells and around it we've got tissue associated monocytes. From here, these can release other cytokines and growth factors, such as vascular endothelial growth factor, which can promote angiogenesis. You can, it can then release matrix metalloproteinases, which can then degrade the extracellular matrix, protein metastasis and invasion, and other cytokines which can cause immunosuppression and promotion of growth. Okay, so the fifth hallmark is activating invasion and metastasis. So 80 to 90% of cancer-related deaths are caused by the metastasis of the cancer. So it's not the primary tumour itself, it's the secondary tumour that can go off to distant locations such as the lungs, the brain, pancreas, liver, etc., which is what causes such drastic issues. So invasion of metastasis is usually stimulated by the breakdown of cell-to-cell -cell adhesion. So this could be a fault in E adherence. So this is what causes the cells to bind together. Degradation of the extracellular matrix, which as I mentioned, the matrix metalloproteinases can degrade the extracellular matrix, allowing the, the tumour cells to invade and break free. And then increased motility, so the chemotaxis of the tumour cells. So distance locations such as the lungs can release certain chemicals which can then cause the tumour cells to migrate towards the lungs in particular. Okay, so here we've got the picture taken from Dorsum and Gutkind's paper in 2007. So here we've got our primary tumour, which remember is a, is a mass which consists of both tumour cells as well as leukocytes such as macrophages and fibrillates, for example. So as a result of inflammation, some tumour cells can then gra gradually begin to break away from the primary tumour. So they are now invading into the surrounding tissues. So once they've begun invading other tissues, they can then start releasing your matrix metalloproteinases down here. So these are then breaking down the extracellular matrix and have now escaped from the primary tumour and are now able to freely move around in the tissue. So once it's now broken away from the primary tumour, it can then reach a blood vessel and undergo a process called introvasation, which is when it can actually enter into the circulatory system. Once in the circulatory system, the tumour is then able to home in on specific organs, such as by tumour homing chemotaxis. So certain chemokines, such as STF1, which is stromal derived factor 1, binds to CXCR4 receptors, which are highly overexpressed on tumour cells and can cause them to, to accurately home in into certain organs. 
So once it's reached its destination site, it can then undergo extraversation, which is when it exits the circulatory system and is then able to deposit itself into the organs. So the four most common organs which tumour cells tend to reach are the lungs, the liver, the bones and the lymph nodes. Okay, so the sixth hallmark of cancer is inducing angiogenesis. So angiogenesis is the formation of new blood vessels. And tumour cells can do this by releasing two cytokines, vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, and basic fibroblast growth factor, or BFGF. So as you can see, the result of these cytokines actually causes the blood vessels to gradually build into the tumour cell, then make an intricate network of new blood vessels, which allow the tumour to become vascularised. Okay, so the seventh hallmark is genome instability and mutation. So tumour cells are constantly evolving and their DNA is constantly mutating in order to adapt to the new surroundings. So as you all probably are aware of, there's BRCA1 and BRCA2, or the BRCA genes. So these are passed down through your family tree line, and if you've inherited one of these genes, you are a lot more likely to develop breast cancer. But other genes which continuously evolve, as I mentioned, is P53, which tumour cells can hijack so they can actually keep going through the cell cycle without having these gatekeepers along the way. And also there's your retinoblastoma gene. So children who contain the fault in the retinoblastoma gene will develop, will have a high chance of developing retinoblastoma, which is an eye tumour. Okay, so the eighth hallmark is resisting cell death. So cell death or controlled cell death is regulated by a fine balance between pro-apoptotic and anti-apoptotic proteins. So your pro-apoptotic proteins involve BAX, BAC, BIM and PUMA. Your anti-apoptotic include BCL2, BCLXL and MCL1. You can read more about these apoptotic agents in other papers, but for the sake of this and time restraints, I'm not going to go into too much detail about them. And the ninth hallmark of cancer is the deregulation of cellular energetics. So around about the 1930s, Otto Warburg discovered that tumour cells undergo a process called aerobic glycolysis. So instead of converting glucose into pyruvate like we usually do, tumour cells convert glucose into lactate in the presence of oxygen. This is much less efficient than normal glycolysis, but this is then compromised with the increased expression of GLUT1. So this allows tumour cells to take in more glucose from the circulatory system. However, although this is less efficient, what it also does is it facilitates the biosynthesis of macromolecules. So undergoing this aerobic glycolysis, they're able to make more amino acid precursors, more nucleic acid precursors, which can then help in the formation of daughter cells. So it actually helps the tumour cells in growing and dividing. So here, this is what we do in normal cells. So you can see that in the presence of oxygen, we convert glucose into pyruvate, which can then enter the citric acid cycle and then the electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation, which results in a massive amount of ATP per molecule of glucose. In the in hypoxic conditions, we convert glucose into pyruvate, like said again, then from pyruvate into lactate. So this only results in about two moles of ATP per mole of glucose. So it's not very efficient at all. So tumor cells in the presence or without the presence of oxygen will convert glucose to pyruvate. And then from pyruvate, instead of putting it into the, into the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, they convert most of it into lactate. So they're then therefore able to make your amino acid and nucleic acid precursors. Then the tenth hormone cancer is sustaining proliferative signaling. So this means they are able to produce their own growth factors, and as a result of this, they also overexpress receptors. So they're more likely to have these growth factors bind to them, and then they are therefore able to signal themselves to grow. So these ones can include vascular endothelial growth factor, basic fibroblast growth factor, and a combination of a CXCL8 or interleukin 8 and CXCR2, which is a receptor for interleukin 8. So these can do these either by autocrine signaling, paracrine signaling, or endocrine signaling. So in autocrine signaling, they're sending out these growth factors which can then bind to themselves. So they're literally targeting themselves for these growth signals. By paracrine signaling, they're releasing these growth factors which can then affect your adjacent or surrounding cells. So this can then cause tumor cells around you to grow and develop. Or they can do it by endocrine signaling. So they release the chemicals into the blood vessels, transport it around, the endocrine system, so your blood vessels by hormones, to target distant cells. So this is a similar action of SDF1, how it enters the blood vessels and can actually allow the tumour cells to metastasize to specific organs. And then this is again just to summarise the 10 hallmarks of cancer. So now it's time for the test yourself section. 
So here I'm going to ask you a sequence of questions. I'm going to tell you how much the question is worth, but I'm not going to give you the mark scheme. I'll leave that up to you to decide how you think the question should be marked. So the first question for 10 marks, which should be pretty simple, list the 10 hallmarks of cancer. And then for 25 marks, explain with reference to examples how these 10 hallmarks are used by cancer cells to ensure their continuous growth and survival. So there you go, these are these two questions. A little bit of cheering on here, this is Galfer from the Anime 7 Daily Sins. Good luck, and good luck revising guys. Peace out.